Welcome everybody to the fourth edition already of the EVM Expeditions, a series where we take a deep dive into various concepts, ideas, protocols within the EVM space and the wider Ethereum ecosystem. Today we're going to be talking about Merkle trees and very fittingly it will be done by Pascal Merkle plant. If you think that you already know everything about Merkle trees and this is boring stuff, I would honestly think twice because there is some very interesting thing to be learned still. Uh, Merkle trees are used within a wide variety of applications and protocols. So yeah, without further ado, Merkle plant, take it away. Then um, let's start. Today we're talking a little bit about family trees, or to be more specific, my big brother, uh, the Merkle tree. Um, the table of contents, so what are we going to check out? We're going to, uh, yeah, a little bit of introduction, some use cases where we can use Merkle trees, and I try to focus there on non-blockchain use cases, um, just because the blockchain ones are probably known by everyone here. Uh, then we're going to check out what exactly are Merkle proofs, how are they constructed, what kind of properties do they have? We will uh, create an airdrop and uh, the like the uh, off-chain Merkle tree and uh, the Merkle proofs. And then we will write a contract or check out a contract for on-chain verification using Soulmate and Open Zeppelin to do again this cross-checking. And then we're going to check into one attack vector. And um, yeah, I hope that one will be exciting as well. Um, okay, so let's start with the introduction. There was this guy, Wolf Merkle. Uh, he did his PhD thesis in 1979 in Stanford, and uh, Ralph Merkel is a um, he was a computer scientist, and nowadays I think he's a biologist. And he had to solve um, the following problem: that uh, when you are given a vector of data items x y to x n, design an algorithm which can quickly authenticate a randomly chosen y, but which has modest memory requirement. And with this, he means that. Um, you do not have to keep a table of all of the uh, of the whole vector of data items. So you just do not have a copy of the uh, database, but still can be able to verify yourself that this specific data is inside of the um, inside of the vector of data items. And uh, yeah, to note here is that authenticate means in this case we can prove that the data item is in the vector. And yeah, as I said, we do not want to have a copy of all the elements. And um, yeah, then he came up with something that was later called Merkle tree. Um, the, the definition of a Merkle tree is that it's a data structure for digitally signing data sets with a desire for fast verification of data consistency. So we have some kind of digitally signing. Um, this is going to be hashes later on. Uh, data consistency is quite important. We can prove that the data is inside uh, the Merkle tree and that it was not mutated, not changed or removed. And it should be comparably fast. And fast is, especially for us Solidity programmers, really important because this means it's gas optimized. Um, we can do this verification on chain. And um, as an example, where you would like to use, for example, a Merkle tree outside of a blockchain application would be um, if you have some kind of central party that manages a public append only log of data. So we have some big company that manages uh, data, which cannot be removed anymore, cannot be mutated anymore, and we only the company only appends new data logs to it. Um, then we want anyone to be able to verify that the log um, was not mutated, not changed. So we do not trust the central party. We do not trust the implementation of the database, maybe the mistakes and they shift some bits accidentally. And uh, we want to verify that the data does not change, is not removed without having to copy the whole database to our home system. And uh, this is where Merkle trees come into the space. Um, Merkle trees have three interesting properties. Um, the first property that we want to have, or that's quite interesting, is um, that for any specific record R, so for any specific data inside of this database, inside of this log, um, and the log has a length of n, we can construct a proof of length uh, of the maximal length of logarithm two of n. So uh, we are dependent on the amount of data that's inside of this log, but we have a logarithmic runtime. So uh, if we 
n rises a lot, uh, our one time of the proof does not uh, rise as much like only in logarithmic two. And um, with this, we allow uh, every client can verify that uh, the specific data item is in the log via a proof of this size. Um, then the second property that we want to have is if we observed one log before, so we have the database and we observe the database and um, the database is afterwards, it gr grows. So new data is added to it. Then we can take this earlier log and can prove that the data that was appended afterwards, um, that we have this earlier log and in the whole database that we now have, which grew, we can prove that this earlier log is still part of the whole database. So we can kind of iteratively uh, continue over time proving that the database was not mutated and uh, can always kind of take snapshots of the database and then can prove that afterwards the database still has this prefix of data. And um, then the third property is that we want to have some kind of auditor or any kind of person to uh, efficiently iterate over the records in the log. So uh, this is important that everyone can efficiently uh, prove this um, that the log was not changed. Um, yeah, I, I linked here a lot of stuff. So if anyone is interested, uh, you can read up on the papers here. And um, yeah, now to the question, how is this achieved? What exactly is a Merkle tree? Um, if we go to Wikipedia, it says a Merkle tree is a tree in which every leaf, um, a leaf in a tree is some node that does not have any children. So in this case here, we see a tree and this one here are the leaves because they don't have any father children. Um, it's labeled with a cryptographic hash of a data block. Important to note here is that we need to use cryptographic hashes. We cannot use any kind of hash function uh, because we do not allow any collisions. We should not have any collisions in our hash functions produced by our hash functions. And if we note that it's not a leaf, it's labeled with a cryptographic hash of the labels of its child nodes. So here we see an example of a, move this to the left. Uh, here we see an example of the of a Merkle tree. So we have down here, we have our data blocks. So this is our database, our logs, the data that we want to uh, uh, build a, construct the Merkle tree from. And we hash each of those data blocks individually. And uh, this will be the leaves of our Merkle tree. So we have the hash of the data blocks. And then uh, we just continuously build up the tree until we only have one hash left. So we take the two leaves on the left side concatenate them together and hash them again. Then we take the next two leaves here, concatenate them together, hash them again. We still have more than one hash left. So again, we concatenate these two hashes and hash them together. And then we have here our uh, root from the tree. This is called the Merkle root. And I hope what's obvious to everyone is that this hash here is uh, unique and can only be created by exactly this data blocks. And as soon as we change any kind of data inside of this, uh, this L1, L2, L3, L4, if we change here any kind of data, it will produce a different hash on this level, which will then produce a different hash on this level and also produce a different hash on the Merkle root. And um, now I need to move this zoom things here again. Then let's go to some interesting use cases. So. Uh, one project that's quite interesting for me is the certificate transparency project from uh, Google. It was initiated by Google. At, and the goal of the certificate transparency project is to strengthen the TLS public key infrastructure. TLS is this transport layer security protocol that enables uh, a secure TCP connection. And for example, HTTPS is built on TLS. And public key infrastructure yeah, means that we have asymmetric cryptography and that we have public keys and that people kind of can find public keys from other people to encrypt them, to build up uh, an encrypted connection. And um, a little bit of background to TLS overall is there are so-called TLS certificates. These are the, the part of the public key infrastructure. And the certificates bind a public key to a domain. So for example, let's say that uh, you want to call google.com um, and you need to know the public key from google.com. Then you check a certificate and there is an, a certificate which says, Google.com has exactly this public key, and you can use this public key to start the encrypted connection with Google. And yeah, as I mentioned already, the certificates are used by any kind of clients, for example, browsers, but also SSH clients or 
yeah, any kind of clients that you want to have, servers, um, to initiate an encrypted channel to the domain server. And um, now we come to a little bit of a problem because where, where do this CTLS certificates come from? Um, they are issued by centralized institutions and the centralized institutions are called certificate authorities. So we have some kind of companies, for example, Google, which is allowed to issue TLS certificates and say uh, facebook.com is, uh, is bound to this public key. And this public key really belongs to facebook.com. We checked this with the engineers and uh, you can trust us that the certificates are correct. And yeah, this is of course um, a problem that I mentioned already, you can trust us. Um, so wh where, do, where, where do you get the certificates from um, when, you, when you want to initiate something to a new domain? Um, in the first try, you have to download them from somewhere. So you are on a new computer, you never went to google.com, uh, you want to call to google.com and you need to have the public key. So you download a certificate from a central authority and um, then you have this, uh, their public key and you can start the encrypted connection. As a side note, uh, operating systems and browser implementations also provide a set of certificates already. But again, we need to trust them that the download did not fail, that there wasn't any bit shifts. And um, now the big question, can you trust the certificate that you just downloaded somewhere from the internet? Um, actually, no, because you could have, there could be a man in the middle attack, maybe someone, uh, while you downloaded the certificate from the central authority, someone went into the middle and um, yeah, gave you a wrong certificate. And um, after, what's important to notice, after you downloaded it one time, the certificate, you can of course copy, have a copy of it locally or produce a hash out of it. And if you download it again, compared to the hash. So overall TLS has a problem that uh, it leads to a so-called tofu situation. Tofu means trust on first use. So the first time we download the certificate, we cannot check it against anything. We just have to trust that in this moment, we were not man in the middle attack. And um, this is also something that probably everyone saw already. If you uh, create some kind of new server, have a new server and SSH into it, via the SSH protocol, you get some kind of uh, scary message, something with unknown host. Do you want to trust this certificate? Yes, no. And then there's this fingerprint, this ASCII art showing up. And of course you press yes, like most of the time. And uh, afterwards the certificate is saved on your computer. And from there on, you know that this, you can always reuse the certificate. But the first time when you download it, you cannot actually um, trust it. Uh, yeah, you have, you have to actually trust that this is the correct certificate. And uh, how does the certificate transparency project wants to achieve more um, transparency in this case is by using a Merkle tree. So the certificate transparency project build a Merkle tree out of certificates that are known. So there's a bunch of certificates flying around and they take all the certificates and add them to a public append only log. So the database of all the certificates from Google and Let's Encrypt is also in this project and Cloudflare and a lot of big internet companies, they all have a database where you can download this certificate transparencies. But then again, there's a question, okay, they manage this database of certificates, but what if they just change some certificates? Google just changes facebook.com uh, public key to their own public key, and then they can read all of Facebook's traffic. Uh, this would not be good. So it needs to be proven that uh, this database is never changed in any kind of way. But on the other side, it's also a big database. And not everyone like academics or other hackers or whatever, they cannot manage this database alone at home. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, we build a Merkle tree out of it and everyone can, via this Merkle proof, they can um, prove that the database itself did not change. No certificates in there, in there were uh, mutated at any point and no, no certificates were removed. And everyone can trust this public database of certificates. And now when you download certificates, you can cross check that uh, you don't know the certificate is actually in this log of known certificates managed by Google and Cloudflare. And um, yeah, this log can be trusted because we know that certificates are never removed. We know that certificates are never, um, are never mutated. So as soon as they're added to this, uh, to this uh, database, we know that they cannot be removed anymore. And again, after the initial download, we can of course um, cache the certificate locally. It's 
kind of only this trust on first use situation. Um, a different project also from Google, but in a different context is uh, the checksum database from the Go programming language, which is also quite interesting. Um, so of course, Go programs can have external dependencies. For example, code hosted on GitHub, you say something like, I want to import in my Go program uh, code from github.com slash byte rocket or something. But again, you have the problem, you download just something from the internet. And how can you um, have kind of reproducible builds and verifiably reproducible builds when you download code from the internet? What I want to have is when I do a publish a Go program and I write it right now on my computer and I have this dependencies and uh, my colleague is downloading the same program a year later in a different space in the world, different area. Uh, I want him, if he builds this program, to have the exact same dependencies on the bit level, exact same dependencies. Nothing there should change. Um, the exact same binary should come out. The dependency should not be able to um, be hijacked and his binary even though we have the same code, uh, he will receive a different binary. Um, so yeah, what they did is again, the same idea. They build a Merkle tree out of this Go packages. Uh, you take a Go package, you hash it, and you add this hash to the Merkle tree. And everyone can later check that um, if you download this Go package version 1.5, you check if this, if your hash that you produce locally, from the code that you downloaded, if this hash is inside of the Merkle tree. And if so, then you know that, um, the, that you downloaded it correctly and it was not changed in the time since it was published. And um, here's a note from the uh, initial proposal uh, to add this, to create this checksum database in which they say, uh, this ensures that unexpected code changes cannot be introduced when first adding a dependency to a module or when upgrading a dependency. And here we again note uh, this thing about first adding. Um, we have again a tofu situation. Afterwards, you can you have these packages locally. You can create the hash out of it yourself. Everything is fine. But um, yeah, we don't want a tofu. And um, afterwards, we can cache the data. And now we come to one in, for us more interesting uh, application of Merkle tree is of course the token airdrop. So uh, we create a new kind of token, and we want to to some set of addresses, we want to airdrop specific amounts of tokens. And um, the question is, how can an illegible address later prove that it is really inside of this set of addresses and is illegal to receive this amount of tokens? And all of this should, of course, be trustless. And um, yeah, the steps to do this, and we're going to go into the code to that into a second two, is uh, we post the Merkle root, so this last hash of the tree on chain. Then we make the Merkle tree publicly available. We post it on all kinds of forums and uh, everywhere so that everyone has this Merkle tree. And um, then everyone can submit a proof that his address is actually inside of the Merkle tree. And this proof is really short. It's O log 2n of the size of addresses. So it can be verified on chain. It does not cost too much gas. We can actually uh, do the verification on chain. And this enables us to trustlessly do this airdrop because the Merkle root is on chain, hopefully immutable or constant, cannot be changed anymore. Everyone can produce the proof and the proof is then checked on chain. So um, we don't have to trust the developers after they publish the Merkle root and the Merkle tree. And now we're going to check what exactly is the Merkle proof and how can we construct them. So we had in the introduction, uh, this property that the size of the proof is O log 2n. And if we remember from, uh, yeah, or if we know this, uh, we have a binary tree. So each um, node is, has at most two childs. And if it's a balanced binary tree, so the, the height is not shifted to one side, then uh, the height of this binary tree is always O log n plus one. Um, so the proof in our case is O log n, O log 2n, um, because this node, the first node is already known, it's the Merkle root. And how can we now construct a proof that, for example, this data here is inside of this Merkle tree, is part of this Merkle root here. Um, we need to provide the verifier with all the information so that he can recreate this root. And then he can, uh, then he can check it against his Merkle root. And if it's the same hash, then uh, we prove that the data is inside. 
So what do we do to prove that number nine, that this data is inside of uh, this uh, hash, is part of this hash, is part of this Merkle tree? We provide the verifier with the data and it produces this hash here, number nine. And um, then we provide the verifier with this hash from number eight, which is public because the whole Merkle tree is public. So he can produce the number four hash here on level one. Uh, then we still need to provide a hash. We provide him hash number five. The verifier again hashes both of this together, receives this hash here. We provide him with the next hash, which is number three. Both of this gets again hashed together by the verifier. He the verifier produces hash number one. And we provide the last hash, level three here, the zero. And he concatenates again both of the hashes together and um, receives the Merkle root, this last hash. And then he just checks, okay, is my Merkle root that I have stored locally equal to the Merkle root that I was like to the hash that I received via this proof from the guy who wants to prove that this data is inside of the Merkle tree. And if so, then it's 100% clear that uh, the data was inside of the Merkle root. And if not, then you can just say, no, the data was not inside of the Merkle tree because we have a different Merkle root. Um, and now, yeah, now we're going to do an airdrop via um, to actually see how all of this works in practice. Uh, we use Open Zeppelin's new Merkle tree JS library. It's uh, actually really new. It was published like 20 days ago. It's a um, in written in TypeScript and it provides us with, yeah, with a nice Merkle tree implementation and an easy API for that. And um, first, we're going to check out how can we. First, we're going to check out how can we build the Merkle tree. Mm, for that, I prepared here a small uh, JavaScript uh, snippet. It's mostly copied from the readme, just added a few more um, comments and uh, changed the addresses. So what do we do here? We uh, import the open Zeppelin Merkle tree package. Uh, we import the object standard Merkle tree. We need access to the file system. Um, then we have our values. So these are the values, the addresses that we want to airdrop some tokens to. So in this case, we want to uh, airdrop to 0x cafe to that address, uh, five tokens, five times 10 to the power 18. And to the um, address B, we want to airdrop another amount of token. And to the address dad, we want to airdrop another amount of tokens. Um, using the Open Zeppelin. Uh, Merkle tree package, it's really easy to construct this Merkle tree here. We just use standard Merkle tree dot off and provide the values. So create us a new Merkle tree uh, from this values. And we need to give him the types, what kind of types are these things. And yeah, the first value here in this tuple is, cuff, uh, is an address. And the second value in this tuple here is a UN256. Um, then we're going to print the Merkle root. So this last hash that uh, yeah, the root of the tree, which is the last hash. Um, we're going to write the whole tree in JSON format to the file system. And we're going to just to have some visualization. We're going to print the whole tree. And um, okay, and then let's do this. So we go into our airdrop folder. We have here this build tree file. Um, let's remove the already created tree. And let's see how we can run this. Pretty easy node build tree. And we now see, okay, cool, we see something. We have our Merkle root, which is here some hash, and we received a tree. We have here two hashes, another hash, another hash, and this hash here is the last hash, uh, B8F. And B8F, yeah, that's our Merkle root because that's the last hash that we received. And um, what are these hashes here now? So we have three values inside of our Merkle tree, right? This tuple, this tuple, and this tuple. So we need to hash two of those tuples together, produce one intermediate hash, and then hash the intermediate hash together with uh, the other tuple, and then we receive the Merkle root. So in this case, this hash here, this uh, like here's the Merkle root, here's the first level in the tree, and here are the two children's, and this is the first value. Uh, this hash here in this case will be the data, will be the hash of this two tuples hashed together. This hash is 
the hash of the next data. And because we have two hashes, we need to combine them and hash them again to this intermediate hash. And this is this one. And then we still have one value left, the dead guy. So we again take uh, the tuple and hash it together. Then we receive this hash. Now we have two hashes left. We concatenate them together and we receive our last hash, which is the Merkle root. And this lowest hashes here, this three, we can only produce by providing exactly these values. And as soon as we change one of those values, the hash here changes, which changes the intermediate hash, which changes the Merkle root. So we can only create this hash here by providing all three of those values. And um, now we want to generate proofs for all of this, um, for all of these addresses, so that they can send them on chain and can have yeah the tokens airdropped. And it's an even shorter script, so we again just import the standard Merkle tree. We load this, uh, we load our tree that we created here, the tree.json, uh, as JSON format from yeah the file system. And then we iterate over all the entries, so all the values inside of the tree, and uh, get the proof for this specific value. And then we print the value, and we print the proof for this specific value. So if we run this, we can um, here see we have the value, which is the cafe address and the token amount. Both of this together are the value in this Merkle tree. And this address needs to provide a, this uh, hash as proof so that um, we can later create the Merkle root. So we know that if we take the hash of this two, uh, of this value and concatenate it with this hash and then hash that together, we will receive this Merkle root hash here at the very end. Um, for the beef guy and for the dead guy in this case, the proof is a little bit longer. Both of them need to provide two hashes. Um, why do they need to provide two hashes? Because if we check here once again, so we have um, the cafe guy only needs to provide one hash. This means the cafe guy is on level three in this case. It's here. So cafe, uh, let's say this is cafe. So cafe needs to provide the hash of this value. And um, then we can create the Merkle root here in this part. But uh, beef and dad are one level lower in the Merkle tree. So they need to provide two hashes because let's assume that um, this is the dad, this is dad. Then dad needs to provide the hash of this, like this value, this hash. Then we can produce this hash. And then it needs to provide the hash of this value. And then we can produce this hash. And then we are again at the Merkle wood. And the same for the beef guy, the last one, it needs to provide the exact opposite hash on this side. So this hash, then we concatenate both of them, produce this hash, and it also needs to provide this hash. And then we can uh, produce the Merkle root. Um, so we also see something that the one needs to provide the hash of the other. And we also see this here. So um, both of them need to provide, as it says here, the beef and the dead guy, both of them need to provide the hash 649, 649, both of them. So this means if this is the dead and this is the beef, they need to create this hash, but both of them need to provide this hash here. And this hash is in this case, the cafe guy um, to produce the Merkle root in the end. And this hash here, we also know what this hash here is. The cafe guy needs to provide this hash as a proof. So if this is the cafe guy, then it needs to provide this hash here to produce the Merkle hash. So this hash here is the hash of the concatenation of the two lower children. And the two lower children are beef and dad. So we know that this hash here is the hash of this element and this element concatenated together and hashed again. And um, yeah, now we have the proof and for all the, um, for all the addresses and everyone can send them now on chain to verify that they should receive this airdrop. Now we're going to check the on-chain verification. We're going to check into Open Zeppelin and Soulmate for the purpose of this presentation. Uh, and yeah, so this is our contract. We uh, import the Merkle proof library from Open Zeppelin. It's in the utils fol folder uh, under cryptography, merkleproof.sol. Um, we create an error, invalid proof. 
we create our Merkle root. The Merkle root is an immutable variable because it should never change. And we give the Merkle root during construction. So when we construct the contract, we set the Merkle root and afterwards it cannot change anymore. This enables us to be trustless that this, Merkle, that this airdrop is, yeah, cannot be changed by anyone anymore. And um, this is something that we'll come into later. And then we are going to uh, write the verification. In this case, we call it airdrop. This function um, does nothing if the uh, verification succeeds. And if the verification fails, then we revert with an invalid proof error. So um, what do we, uh, what does the function need? Well, first of all, it needs the amount of tokens that uh, the address wants to receive. In the example of the uh, coffee guy, it wants to receive uh, five tokens, so five times 10 to the power 18. And then we need to have the proof. We can take it as call data because we do not, uh, we do not mutate the uh, data that we receive, then this is more cheap gas wise. Yeah, so we need to have a variable length array of uh, hashes that is our proof. And uh, then the question is, what is the leaf of our um, of our Merkle tree? Well, that is the message to sender, the address, so 0x coffee, 0x beef, and the amount of tokens that he wants to receive. And we need to, if we used open Zeppelin's Merkle tree, uh, library, then we need to concatenate them and hash them in this way, which they uh, described in the readme. So in the end, we just ABI encode the message.sender and the amount, hash that, concatenate the caches again, and hash that again. And this is our lowest element in the tree. And uh, then it's uh, we just need to call open Zeppelin's Merkle proofs verify function. We provide the proof, we provide the Merkle root, we provide a leaf, which is our address at uh, the message of sender, and it just returns whether the proof is valid or not. And if it's not valid, then we revert. And now we're going to test this. So um, <clears throat> yeah, here we have a. So here we have the test. We um, take our Merkle. We take uh, we define our Merkle root. What is our Merkle root? We have it here. The Merkle root is this hash here. So we can copy it here. When we create this Merkle verification contract, we give him the root um, that was provided by us from the Open Zeppelin library. And then we want to create the proof, which is in bytes 32 array because we're talking about hashes. And for the beef guy, what is the proof that we need to send for the beef guy. The beef guy is here. So we need to provide this two hashes, 458 and 649. So we copy them into the array, 458, 649. And uh, then we prank that we are uh, the beef guy. So that message.sender here in this case will be 0xb. And then we say, okay, we want to have our airdrop of 25 to the times 10 to the power 17 tokens and here's the proof that we were really in this data set and you can later check this with your Merkle proof and uh, with your Merkle root and if we run this uh, then we get an error because this should be commented out so if we want to uh, check whether we whether the on-chain verification works correctly, then we see here that we have a test valid proof. So uh, we prank that we are zero XB. We call the airdrop function. We provide the amount of tokens that we want to have and the Merkle proof, and everything works fine. We do not revert. And now we want to create an invalid proof. So let's say that we provide the exact same proof that we have, but we want to change the token amount. So instead of uh, 2.5 tokens, Beef now wants to have 300 tokens. And um, otherwise the proof is the same. And if we run this again, then we see test invalid proof here that the uh, Merkle verification airdrop function reverted with invalid proof. So that's good. He cannot receive more tokens than he should receive. And if we, if we, instead of changing the um, 
changing the tokens amount, we maybe just change here the bytes. So instead of six, we're going to go with a five. And if we run this again, we see that the Merkle proof uh, verification again failed. We provided an invalid proof. And the only way we can create an valid proof is by exactly using this intermediate hashes and creating the leaf uh, correctly. And uh, now just a cross check to soulmate. How is the soulmate verification done here? We see we have the same contract, invalid root, uh, invalid proof error. We create the Merkle root. And yeah, it really looks exactly the same. The only difference is actually in this case for the user that uh, Merkle proof, the library is called Merkle proof and in Solmet is called Merkle proof lib. So um, that's really not much of a difference. And if we check the test, it's also exactly the same because we need to still produce the same hashes as the same proof with the hashes inside. And obviously this test fail and succeed in the same way as open zeppelins. So both of them are, for this use case, totally uh, the same. And um, yeah, before we come to attack vectors, we're going to check the um, implementation of how does Open Zeppelin implement this, uh, this verification. So here we have the library Merkle proof that we use. We use the verify function. Um, Open Zeppelin provides each of these functions two times, one time as normal verify and one time verify call data. So one time they take it as memory, the proof, and one time they take the proof as call data. Otherwise, this, the functionality is exactly the same. And let's check again here how we can create the Merkle proof. So um, what do we do here? The, if we call the verify function, which takes the proof, the root, and the leaf, it just calls first process proof. OK, process proof is implemented here. It takes the proof and the leaf, and it says our current computed hash is the leaf. So we have, um, so we have this is our leaf, and this is our currently computed hash. And then it just says, okay, iterate over the uh, array of proofs, or, or iterate over the, all the proof elements that we have. And for each proof element that we have, we just take our current computed hash and hash it together with the element of the proof. So if we look at this here, this is our current leaf, our current computed hash. We take the first element of the root uh, of the proof. We hash both of them together. The proof is not yet done so uh, because there's more elements. So we take the next element. We hash both of them together. We again take the next element. We hash both of them together. Again, the next one. So long until the proof is empty. And then... Yeah, if the proof is empty, we just return the, uh, this last hash that we have here. And in the verify function, we see this last hash that is returned has to equal our Merkle root that uh, we saved on chain. And if this is the case, then um, yeah, the proof succeeds. And if we have any kind of different hash here, then uh, the proof does not succeed. And then let's check out this hash pair function because there's one implementation detail that I left out so far. It's the question of how do you concatenate these hashes together? If we provide here number nine and we give us proof number eight, do we is and we concatenate both of these hashes together? Is eight the prefix? Like is eight the first hash and nine the second, or is nine the first hash and eight the second? And um, yeah, we just use here a really simple um, rule by just saying that uh, the smaller hash, if we see it as a number. The smaller hash is always the first part, the prefix, and the taller hash is um, the bigger hash is, is the suffix. So uh, in this case of eight and nine, we just take, check which of these hashes is the smaller number, and that one is the yeah the first hash on the left side, and the other one is the hash on the right side. And then we have one rule of how we can always how we always hash these two hashes together, and then. Yeah, they call efficient hash either AB or BA, depending on the uh, size of the hashes. And if we see this efficient hash, it, it is some assembly, but uh, it's really not that hard. So we do a memory store. We store at position 0x0 and x, at position 0x20, the two hashes, A and B. If we remember from the uh, 
soulmate uh, introduction, we know that uh, 0x0 until 0x40 is the so-called scratch space. So this is memory um, area that you can use for anything. And um, yeah, the 0x20 here in hexadecimal is 32 because we have, a, so we have a 32 bytes. So we write starting from 0x0, the first 32 bytes, and then starting from 0x20, uh, the second 32 bytes. And then we just say to, to our catchhack function that it should hash zero, like the space from 0x0 until 0x40. Uh, we hash that together and this is our value. And then we return the value here in the hash pair. We get it as our current computed hash. And at some point, this last hash will be the Merkle root or will be our last hash. And then we check whether it's equal to our Merkle root. And now we're going to check just, uh, just for fun the soulmate implementation, but we're going not going in too much detail there because as you can expect, it's mostly assembly. Um, yeah, but in the end, it, in the end, it also kind of does the same thing. If we have some kind of proof, we here iterate over the proof, we create the catcher cache out of this out of our current leaf. And in the very end, we check if our last leaf that we have equals our root that was given to us. And if so, then the proof is valid. And here's also one interesting question already. So what if we provide a proof with zero length? Um, then it just assumes that this hash, that this leaf was the Merkle root. So can we actually, can we actually just give in the Merkle root and then receive a valid proof um, that, I mean, the Merkle root is part of the Merkle tree, so we should kind of receive a valid uh, proof out of this. And this is an attack vector that we're going to look at now. It's called a second pre-image attack. <clears throat> so um, the question is, we have this Merkle tree here, and for this airdrop example, we only want to prove whether this data, whether the address and the token amount is inside of the Merkle tree, right? Um, but can we also prove that this intermediate hashes here are also part of the Merkle tree? And uh, the answer is yes, we can definitely do this because um, if we want to prove that this hash here is inside of the Merkle tree, we can just provide this hash and we get again the Merkle root. If we want to prove that this hash is inside of the Merkle tree, we can provide this hash, this hash gets computed, and then we can provide this hash and we again land at the Merkle root. And, uh, Yeah, this is kind of what I was written here. Okay. Yeah, and the second pre-image attack overall is when um, you're given some data and uh, you attack this, like your task is to find a second set of data that generates the same hash. So let's say, um, yeah, you have a video file and the video file, your video file created this kind of um, hash. And if I'm now able to find a different file, different video file, for example, that creates the same hash, then I had an ex a successful second pre-image attack. And this is kind of easy for a Merkle tree because it's kind of being defined by having a lot of pre-images. This Merkle root has this pre-image. So how we can construct the root, we can take this hash and this hash, but we can also take this hash, this hash, this hash, and this hash if we concatenate and hash them the correct way. Um, with all of these hashes and data in between, we can construct the same Merkle root. But, um, so this is an inherent problem of Merkle trees. And it's interesting because most of the time we are not actually interested in proving that some intermediate hash is part of the Merkle tree. We are only interested in proving that all of this um, data is part of the Merkle tree. And in reality, this um, is kind of easy to fix because you can just inside of your Merkle tree implementation, you can differentiate between uh, the data, so the leaves, and the intermediate hashes. So if you have some kind of node in your tree, you just add a bit if it's an intermediate hash. And if it's an intermediate hash, you do not accept any proof that wants to prove that it's inside of the Merkle tree. And if it's a node, then you don't have that bit, you have it set to zero, and only then you accept any kind of proofs. And now we're going to yeah, do exactly that. We're going to prove something that does not make a lot of sense to proof, but it's a, it's a nice attack. So we can actually attack this uh, from open Zeppelin and the and soulmate, this 
Merple tree implementation via a second pre-image attack. Um, even though it does not have so much, like it does not really, it's, it's a fun attack that we can do now, but it does not have any practical relevance because like for example, in our airdrop uh, thing here, we cannot airdrop them, we see this now. So uh, yeah, let's have our faulty verification function here, the second pre-image attack. And we again have the Merkle proof library in which we call verify. We give in the proof, the Merkle root and the leaf. And the difference to this function is that we do not compute the leaf on chain. We receive the leaf by the user already. So the user can give us the proof and the leaf. And um, then we use that to verify whether the leaf is inside of the um, Merkle tree. And if so, we do nothing. And if not, then we revert again. And um, what can we do now? As What can we now provide as leaf? Um, so as leaf, we could, of course, provide our address and our value that we want. But we could, for example, also provide just this hash. And this hash together hash together with this hash is also a valid, is also the same valid Merkle root. So um, yeah, let's do this here. We have here our, <clears throat> we have here our uh, Merkle root and our proof. So let's just take, do we take here? Let's just take, let's want to prove, let's prove that this hash is inside of the Merkle tree. This hash is not, um, is the concatenation of this value and this value together and then hash. Um, so we can prove that it's inside of the Merkle tree because it's an intermediate element. And as the proof that we need to provide, to prove that this hash is inside of the Merkle tree, we need to provide this hash here because this hash concatenated with this hash together produces the Merkle root here. And this is what we're going to do. We uh, take this. CBC hash, this intermediate hash, so in this case, for example, the zero hash here, and we provide as our proof the next hash, which is this one, and this two together will be able to, with this, we will be able to produce the Merkle root. And um, if we now run the test, um, we get an error. This is ah, this I was think the, the spelling is. I, I changed the wrong, I changed the soulmate implementation contract and not the open sapling here, it's still commented out. Like this. So okay. Yeah, I just implemented it in both uh in both contracts. It works as the exact same in both contracts, just to not be any uh biased here in which of these two contracts we showed in. So um yeah, this is now inside of the open using the open Zeppelin um, version, and and this is the test for the open Zeppelin version. And yeah, we're going to run this now. So if we look here, we see uh, the second pre-image attack. It works. We provide as leave this hash here CBC something as the proof. We provide. Um, 649, which is this hash here. So we provide, yeah, we provide the hash and like the intermediate hash, and we can prove that the intermediate hash is inside of the Merkle tree. And um, yeah, we successfully kind of second pre image detect the soulmate and open Zeppelin uh, contract Merkle proof uh, implementation. But as I mentioned, this does not really have so much. Um, real world application in our blockchain space and our on-chain space. Um, because what is this leaf? This leaf we receive already as hash, as hash. It's an intermediate hash. So we have no way here to um, actually airdrop any tokens to anyone because we don't have any message to sender. We cannot uh, recalculate, like calculate the hash backwards to receive some message to sender. Um, so for the airdrop example, this is not important. Because yes, it is in the um, in the tree, but um, we do not know where to send the um, where to send the tokens to. Um, but what is kind of important for different applications is uh, to remember always have the Merkle root immutable in your contract as a constant or as immutable, so that no one else can change it anymore. And always calculate the leaf, the lowest amount, like this data, like get the data and do the first hash by yourself 
so that you um, have kind of the uppest and the lowest part of the Merkle tree. And the in-between part cannot be changed by anyone without having later on a different hash. Um, so this is kind of, yeah, the learning for the auditing. The leaf needs to be computed on-chain and the Merkle root needs to be immutable on-chain. And with that, we are through. And yeah, I hope everyone enjoyed it and stuff. I now see you again. Yeah, so if there are any questions or something, hit it. Uh, just in, for the implementation purposes, I think uh, the array of uh, proof hashes that you're passing, we cannot change the order of the hashes, right? It has to be in the same order. Exactly, yeah. If we look here on the... Uh... Here in this Merkle proof, exactly. If we, we need to first, the first proof needs to, the first uh, hash in the proof needs to be number eight, the second one, number five. Um, yeah, exactly. Other than that, it was like a super clear presentation. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, I always like to talk about my family. <laughs> Too many jokes about that, I guess. Um, in the example for the the open zeppelin concatenation, concatenation? Mm -hmm. yeah, hard word. Um, uh, you you said you you basically take the the bigger one and add the smaller one, uh, or uh, yeah yeah add the smaller one to it. Um, is this the official like Merkle uh, proof variant? Uh, in this case here, this uh, the first hash and the second, which yeah. which way you concatenate. Mm -hmm. Um, no, definitely. Like it depends. In uh, in the, I think it's. I mean, Open Zeppelin has it here implemented and so made the same. So it's definitely for our on-chain uh, verification. It's the standard, I would say. But um, in our case, for this airdrop, we have the Merkle tree um, computed directly. Right? We get one Merkle tree, and that's it. But in this um, Go package example, for example, the certificate transparency, we have a Merkle tree that's. Uh, that's going to be built up over time. There's more and more data appended afterwards. So there mm -hmm. you need to have some different kind of rules because it could be that later on you receive data that's smaller than data that was there. So there you need to define it differently. So, so it could be that you basically have run into the problem where you have this concatenation on the on-chain side and on the off-chain side, you have a different concatenation. So they uh, like they don't work with each other, right? Um, exactly, and I think this was even written in the um, in the uh, readme from Open Zeppelin that this was as, as, uh, exactly the reason why they made this Merkle tree library. Uh, why they made this Merkle tree my library to be uh, yeah working uh, nicely in combination with their contract because uh, yeah a lot of people exactly did this wrong. This concatenation yeah, or differently. This uh, convention is definitely true for uh, binary search trees. In like binary search trees, the left side is al always the smaller key and the right side is always the uh, larger key. But like yeah. that's uh, computer science, not blockchain exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would also say that it's a reasonable thing to do, like either yeah, from right. lowest to highest yeah. or from highest to lowest, but yeah. Okay, cool. Um, maybe as another note, um, because like I did some NFT projects that include Merkle proofs um, and uh, for the attack uh, vector that you, you added, um, I had a discussion about with with some people about it, and uh, I think we we agreed to to basically do the um, the providing of the Merkle proof itself on a private uh, server, so the uh, Merkle tree itself never gets exposed. So you basically just send your address, and it sends back the proof. Technically, I think you could reproduce if enough users use the. Uh, uh, the, the 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 proof system you could reproduce the whole tree just from the from the proof list what i think is pretty interesting yeah yeah that's true if the if the users would gossip each other their proofs that they have and share I mean, their addresses I'm, that are legal then you could after time reconstruct this merkle tree 
I mean also on chain because like everything is every uh, interaction is is recorded right so so if if at some point everyone um, had an interaction where they provided their proof you could reproduce the whole thing yeah but overall like this is not bad like market fools are, are the idea behind it is that everything is public in it um for an nft mint where you for example um just need to have the message that sender where you could just in this airdrop token you in this erc20 airdrop you always have the amount which is important which needs to be part of the data if you have an nft which is really just about the address and no amount inside of it then you need to be more careful about the second pre-image attack because someone for example could provide all of this intermediate hashes and every time a new nft is minted and sent to the message that sender so there it's important to also calculate the leaf on chain yeah you know one one discussion point was also um that you want to hide the addresses of the whitelist users because they get spam uh ah, without okay. ends, for example yeah mm -hmm. yeah then i mean yeah yeah, yeah. No, please go ahead no I, I mean yeah i mean then it makes sense i mean you could also i guess hash the addresses again and just publish the hash of the address and then everyone can create their own hash and check if they're in the whitelist and latest via the on-chain uh, transaction it's anyway public but then i guess the spam also stops because you have your nft and don't give it away anymore yeah no, just just as a side mm -hmm. note yeah interesting so basically right. the uh white listed uh hashes i mean the proof hashes that are given to the whitelisted addresses uh it is not an issue if they're public because you need to be the message dot sender and know the exact uh amount to be able to get your NFT right exactly yeah and felix is saying that if the addresses are public who get whitelisted people will try to somehow get their private key and like spam them with no 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 no, no. Okay. For, for for me it was more of a um like the the friend uh my, my roommate that got me into the whole nft stick he said that like famous people tend to like the whales um if you know that they're in one project for example like people start to uh press them on some some special matters for example um because like they have a lot of influence in there and if you know what they they are into something uh, somehow the the project for example explodes or i mean you probably mm. want that as a um as a host of the project but uh yeah it's not so nice from a from a user experience i would say yeah makes sense yeah totally <laughs> all right Thank you very much for the great expedition into Merkle trees. Um, yeah, that was it for this week's EVM expedition. Tune in next time and we'll see you there. Thank you.